you know, I used to have patients come into me. I remember when I first started, I had a functional medicine practice. Mm -hmm. And when patients started coming into me, the biggest surprise to me was when I would ask them, how are you doing? And I would go through their list of symptoms. The most common thing I heard now is oftentimes uh, moms uh, in my practice, but they would say, I'm overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I'm overwhelmed. I'm burnt out. I feel like they have the weight of the world on my shoulders. I hear this from so many men and women today. What, why is that? Well, I mean, we, we live in an era of uh, exponential choices, uh, outrageous expectations, uh, exhausting noise. If you compare our times to, let's say, pre-1895, it's far easier to survive physically in the world, literally. It was very tough to survive uh, in 1895, but there were no options. I mean, that's part of what made life hard. If, if you went to market, you've got 28 items. If, you, if you've got some malady, some physical malady, there's hardly any options available to you. And so, but at the same time, you were not overwhelmed in the same way by the just crescendo of noise. And when we're hammered by all of that noise, the risk is that we get caught up in the trivial, in the peripheral, uh, the shallow, uh, and, and so we miss the things that matter. And, and, and we can spend enormous amount of our time, energy, resources, uh, pursuing things that in the end do not address the real issues, do not get to the essentials. And so our lives are sort of completely out of balance in this way. Yeah, I, I can absolutely see this, this sort of idea of out of balance. You know, I, I, there, there are a lot of people, it's, it's really easy to fall, fall, fall into that. G give me the idea, uh, the main core of the principle behind effortless. Well, they work together. So the idea is in essentialism is focus. And the idea in effortless is simplification. And so you, you need both because it's not just about doing the right things. It's about doing them in the right way. I remember coaching um, a woman. She's a manager. Uh, she's the kind of insecure overachiever who's up at 4 a.m. in the morning photoshopping for a unpaid nonprofit youth group the next day. No one's asking her to do it, but this is how she's wired. She's the kind of person who feels guilty if she eats lunch, not if she takes time away for lunch. I mean, just even if she eats it. So there's a certain mindset at play there. Maybe you could say it's a sort of Puritan mindset, but it's something like if I'm not sacrificing to the point of, of pain, then I'm not giving enough, then I'm not serving enough, I'm not helping enough. And, and so there was this endless tendency to overcomplexify everything that's coming her way. So I'm coaching her and I said, well, listen, what you need to do is a little bit like the Seinfeld episode uh, in, in which George Costanza suddenly realizes he's been making all the wrong choices his whole life. So he just does the opposite day. And, yeah. and, and he says, I'm going to do everything different to my intuition. And I said, that's what I want you to do. Invert. The next time you're asked to do something, invert it. Stop. Stop. Pause. How would I do this? as in an effortless way, instead of in this exhausting, overcomplicating way. She gets a call you know, the next day or so from, she works at an edu educational institution, and uh, the, the professor wants her to come and bring her videography team, record his lesson for the rest of the year, his class. And she is about to jump into it. I'll bring the whole team, we'll edit it all together, we'll have intros, outros, music, we'll, we'll wow him, gonna amaze him because this is that mindset. And she remembers, no, invert, opposite day. And what she does instead, she says, okay, hold on, let me just pause. You know, is there an effortless way to achieve what you want to achieve? Uh, and, and it turns out that this was going to be for one student who was going to miss a few classes because of an athletic commitment. And the solution that she helped to identify was, well, what if someone just on their iPhone records whatever classes he misses and sends it? Oh, I had not thought about that head slapping moment the professor has. It saves her four months of work for her and her entire team. 
And she came out with this sudden awareness. There is a different way to do life. Extreme simplicity, but it starts with this mindset. How can I make it effortless instead of, well, how can I wow them? How can I do everything with bells and whistles? This was a, a tipping point for her, and I think it's illustrative of other people and what they can do beyond just figuring out what's essential. It's how to do it effortlessly. It's so good. And obviously, as you said, bu busyness, right? This sort of, which is in a way, it's this artificial uh, trying to make myself feel like I'm I'm doing a lot rather or, you know, getting ahead, even if you're not, uh, obviously plays a big pull. And, and I can really see how this essentialism and effortless really go hand in hand. You know, I, I think that there are so many people, and I've heard you talk about this, they are conditioned to believe. And, and I was trained this way by, uh, actually, I, I was in a coaching group one time, and basically they said everything was about just work until you're exhausted, right? Just, you know, it works 60 hours a week. And I got to the point where it gave me major health. I actually developed health issues my first couple of years in practice because I was yeah, working 60, 80 that. hours a week. So talk yes. to me about that mentality of wh wh why is that so prevalent and, and how do we counteract that? Well, there's a single mindset behind all of this. I just um, did an episode, a podcast episode entirely about this on the 85% rule, but let me just try to give a synopsis of it. The, the, there is a dominant mindset. Maximum effort equals maximum results. Uh, it's like a, a bad 1980s motivational speaker. But that idea has infiltrated so many of the thought practices of insecure overachievers. So people that want to have high performance assume because of that simplistic idea well therefore if i want to overperform i have to overwork i have to overstrain i have to overcomplicate more must produce better results and the thing is it doesn't the, the data does not support that and it hasn't for the last let's say quarter of a century meaning that the data we've been gathering over the last quarter of a century shows that that's not the case the, what what is true is that optimal effort equals optimal or even maximum results and and that's it's just a rule of thumb but that's what the 85 percent rule is all about so i'm not arguing that we do nothing that we do not put in any effort the effortless effort that sweet spot does require effort but it starts to feel effortless because it's just in that right position where we're giving you know we're giving of ourselves in a challenging way but not to the point that we're using up tomorrow's reserves hmm. and and if you'll allow me there's a case study that blew my mind as i was researching effortless it's it's one of the most physically arduous challenges imaginable 1850s Everybody in the, you know, the developed world at that time is fascinated with who will be the first to get to the South Pole because nobody in all recorded history had ever done it. And lots of people had tried. And then two teams set off on almost the same day from two different locations to try to have a race to the poles. There's a British team with what I would describe as this outdated mindset. Maximum effort equals maximum results. And their idea, led by their captain, was go as far as you possibly can day one. And the same for day two and day three and so on, because that will get you there faster. Well, that isn't what happens, and it's not what happened for him. What happened is that he burned his team out really quickly so that as soon as they had their first bad weather day, they started the journey and couldn't make it two inches, end up going back into the tents and just sitting there, you know, exhausted, mentally fatigued, writing in their journals. Could anybody make progress in weather like this? Well, one team could, and that was the Norwegian team that they were competing against. Their leader, the, the, the expedition leader, had a different idea. He'd learned it from the Eskimos, which is that you can't go, you can't push too hard because in those extreme weather conditions, you, you can't sweat too much because that becomes a tre tremendous risk to your overall health. And so he'd learned this in a very tangible way, this 85% rule. And so as a result, he set the limit 15 miles. On good weather days, we will hold back from 40, 50 mile efforts that we could achieve, and we're gonna do 15 miles. That meant that on their first bad weather day, they were able to continue and do 15 miles. They carried on doing this 15, 15, 15. 
but the plot thickens when he got within 45 miles of the South Pole. They have perfect weather and perfect sledding conditions, and they don't know where the British team is. So for all they know, the British team is ahead of them. And the question I always pose to people is like, what would we do and why? Would we push or would we pace? And, and my sense is, at least if I'm honest myself, I'd push. I'd go, okay, fine, we'll break the rule this one time. One day we can make it. We'll do 45 miles and, and maybe that will make the difference. But he doesn't because he understands the, 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 the vital power of this restrained approach. So they take three more days averaging again 15 miles per day. Well, what happens? They get there before the British team. They beat them by more than 20 days. It's unthinkable to the rest of us that such a thing is true. There was a moment when I read the original biography about this, when the biographer said something so outrageous, I just, it almost knocked me off my chair. He said, the Norwegian team made progress every day without particular effort. Now, to me, that's outrageous. It's a ridiculous thing to say. How can the most physically arduous task, almost imaginable to humans at that time be described in that way. And yet that is how they won. And not only how they won, but they also had to make the 16,000 mile journey back. So that's a non-trivial part of the story because they all made it alive, but the British team who did make it to the South Pole, but had lost the race, had nothing left and they all died on the way home. In that case study, you can see, I think, the, the argument for the 85% rule of this effortless way of thinking, because if you can find a way to, to pace your progress so that you have enough left in the tank for tomorrow, you avoid the boom and bust approach to execution that the British team inevitably fell into. That's what so many people are doing, and it keeps them from what would otherwise be sustainable high performance and instead creates this kind of crazy world in which we live in which you yes okay there's moments of performance followed by burnout followed by stress followed by relationship strain health strain and all the rest of it in this vicious cycle that we that we see because it's based in a bad paradigm to me this is one of the case studies that gives me fire for the deed on these subjects i mean this is it, it's a powerful story i i love i mean it's uh it, it's yeah, I, I'd never heard that story before. I, I um, it's it's you know it's it's the idea of in a way the tortoise and the hare as well, right? It's a slow and steady wins the race. It's you know pacing yourself and and saving fuel in the tank. You know, I, I'm reminded of a couple things. One, I had a track and field coach who used to always tell me I used to start off way too fast. You know, right. every race I did. And the first lap around, I'm cruising, I'm in first place, and then I just totally burn myself <laughs> out. And so I found when I started to race differently and started to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to stay in the middle of the pack. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep a little bit of fuel in the tank for that last you know, 200 meters. I performed the best. And so that was so good. And then I experienced the same thing you're sharing with uh, when I was in practice. When I was in practice, I um, well, at one point... I, I, I was doing, you know, like I said, 68 hours a week. And then I had an injury. I was doing CrossFit. I ended up hurting my back, laying down for a couple of weeks. And I realized, well, I can't be doing all this stuff. I couldn't do anything. So I was on the phone and I just started telling my team members, I just started leading them and encouraging them and telling them, hey, do this, do this, basically acting like a coach to my team. Mm. And I kept doing that for the full year. And we went from growing by 10% to, I want to say we grew eight times that single year. And yeah. the only thing that was different was rather than me doing all of the work, I instead was helping my team work smarter. Mm. 